the <laughs> it's uh, you know what doesn't that feel like life sometimes though that uh, sometimes you feel on top of the world and things are going great and then man something happens life happens bad things happen and in that moment the question is what do you have in that moment that is strong enough to carry you through? What do you have that is strong enough to get you through the difficult and hard things of life? Well, I want you to know, we're not going to talk this morning about strong cheese. Okay? This morning, we're going to talk about a strong gospel. There is a beautiful, strong gospel that is strong enough to carry you and to carry me through the difficult things in life. And not only strong enough to carry us through those difficult times, but strong enough to be so powerful enough that it not only carries us, but God uses the gospel through us to help other people. He advances the gospel through us. This morning, I invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Verses 12 through 18. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. We're going to look at a passage of scripture that at first glance doesn't seem to be a great commercial for Christianity. But actually, it's a passage that shows the strength and beauty and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my prayer today is that God will use his word to encourage us, First Baptist Church DeSoto, to be a gospel advancing church. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, God's word says this. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use this word today to remind us of the goodness and power of the gospel and that you would use this, God, to make us gospel-advancing Christians. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing this letter to the church in Philippi, and he is actually, as he writes this, he is in prison in Rome because of his Christianity. And yet, here's a man who is in prison in Rome, and he's rejoicing. Why is he rejoicing? He's rejoicing because the gospel of Jesus Christ is advancing even while he is in chains. You see, for Paul, nothing was more important than the gospel advancing. And church, nothing should be more important to us as believers and as a church than to see the gospel advancing. Look with me again at verse 12. Paul says this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel We're going to see from our text 
how to advance the gospel. How does the gospel advance? But before you can advance something, right, before you can advance the gospel, before you can move the gospel forward, we need to make sure that we understand the gospel. We need to know, what is the gospel? If, if it's something that's so powerful that, that nothing can stop it, that it should advance, well, well, what is it? What is so beautiful and so powerful and so wonderful about the gospel that not even chains, not even being locked up can stop it from going forward? Well, well, what is that? Look down in verse 18. Look at what the Apostle Paul says. Paul says that the gospel is this. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, here it is, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. So the word gospel means good news, right? And here's the good news. The good news is the proclamation of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that's the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, and then, praise God, he was raised from the dead. That is the good news. That is the gospel. And I don't have to convince you today that we live in a broken world, right? We live in a very broken world. Terrorism, racism, poverty, corruption, hatred, suffering, death, war. Why is our world so messed up? Why is it the way that it is? You know what? It wasn't that way in the beginning, was it? This isn't the way that God designed our world to be in the beginning. In fact, God created a world that worked perfectly. God created a world that he said was very good. God created a world where we had perfect harmony with him and perfect harmony with each other. He created us to have a loving relationship with him that would last forever. And he created us in a way that we always got along with one another. We always loved each other. But when you look around our world today, that's not the way the world looks today, is it? Today, when you look around the world, we see suffering and we see pain, and we see hardship, and we see separation. The Bible tells us that while God started this world with this beautiful design for us to have this relationship with him that would last forever, humanity has rejected God's good design for us, and instead of enjoying that relationship with God, we said, God, we want to rule ourselves. We want to be in charge of ourselves. We will determine right from wrong. And in that moment, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, sin entered into the world. And when sin entered into the world, you have brokenness that spread all over the world. Why is our world the way it is today? Our world is the way it is today because sin is in the world. And that's why there's brokenness. We have left God's good design. And this is what we see. And it has caused separation between human beings and and it has caused separation between us and God, a separation that will last forever. But that's not good news, is it? <laughs> but don't you sometimes have to understand how bad things are before you realize how good something else might be? And, and, and don't we need to sometimes realize that we're not going to go to the hospital unless we realize how sick we are? Oh, the Bible paints a picture for us that we are very, very sick, that, that, that we are in trouble, that we are in danger, and God is holy and good, and he can't let us get away with rebelling and rejecting him in our lives. But here is what God has done. This is the gospel. Here is the good news. The good news is that God doesn't want to punish us. He doesn't want us to be separated from us. So what does he do? He sends Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, who lived perfectly according to God's design. He never did anything wrong. And he died on a cross. And when he died on a cross, God did a miracle. He took all of our sin, all of our shame, 
all of the things that separate us from him, he took all of that and he placed it on Jesus. And when Jesus was on the cross, he died and he paid for those sins. And then he rose from the dead three days later. And now we are offered this amazing opportunity that if we will turn from our sins and believe that Jesus alone paid for our sins, that he is the only way that we can be made right with God. The Bible says everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I hope that you today have heard that good news and received that good news and that you believe that Jesus died in your place. This is the gospel. This is good news. And let me tell you something. This is the good news. uh, Sometimes we think, what's it going to take for the gospel to advance in our community? What's it going to take? Is it going to take bigger budgets? Is it going to take bigger buildings? Or is it going to take Christians who have a bigger view of the good news of Jesus Christ? And we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Never underestimate the power of the gospel in the mouths of Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit. The gospel is a non-stop, unstoppable force. And if you have experienced salvation in your life, you've experienced the good news. Just be reminded today of how wonderful that is. That the wrath of God has been satisfied in Jesus Christ. And God is not against you. He is for you. And he who began this good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Well, here you have a man who's in prison. And he used to be against Jesus. He used to be against Christians. But God stopped him in his tracks one day. And he saw his need for Christ. And Jesus saved him, and his life was absolutely turned around. That's what the gospel does. The good news of Jesus turns things around, and he experienced a fresh start, a new creation, forgiveness of sins. And that gospel had an impact in his life that wasn't just for him, but he knew it was a message that had to be shared. He knew that it was a message that had to be delivered no matter what it took. Paul's life was absolutely turned around by Jesus, and now his mission is to advance that message everywhere where God would put him. So here you have Paul. He's stuck in prison, and yet the gospel is advancing. In verse 12, he says, I want you to know that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. How? How can bad things that happen to a believer like Paul. How can the gospel keep going? Why doesn't it stop? Here, why, why would Paul keep on advancing the gospel, and how would it keep on advancing when, when you go through such hardship and pain in your life, and it still goes, it keeps going? How can that happen? That's what we're going to focus on the rest of our time this morning, is how can we become gospel-advancing Christians? And number one, Here's the first thing I see in this text. We must see every situation as a gospel-advancing situation. We must see every situation as a gospel-advancing situation. Verse 12 again. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, notice that phrase. Paul says, what has happened to me? What has happened to me? That's a, that's a passive sentence, right? That's a passive. He, Paul is saying that something's happened to him that it was outside his control. He, he didn't do it. Something happened to him. He's not the one doing it. In other words, something happened to Paul that was outside his control. He didn't do it. It was done to him. Well, well what happened to Paul? Well, he was thrown in the prison, right? He was thrown in the prison because of his faith in Jesus. And he's waiting to see if he's going to be set free or if he's going to be executed. He doesn't know. He doesn't know if he's going to be set free or if he's going to be executed. This is out of his control, but here's the key. It's not out of God's control. The situation happening to Paul was out of his control, but it was not out of God's control. That's a truth we need to cling to today. When it feels sometimes like life is out of our control, remember, church, It's not out of God's control. It's not out of his control. Look at verse 16. Paul says, he's talking about these people, 
Some people are preaching the gospel, and they, they love Paul. But some people are preaching the gospel because they want to hurt Paul. But he says this, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So on one hand, Paul can say, what's happened to me has really served to, to advance the gospel. He can say, what's happened to me? Something out of my control. And yet he can say a few verses down here later that he can say, I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. And my question is, well, who put Paul in prison? Well, obviously, Romans put him in prison, right? However, I think that we could say today that what has happened to Paul is a part of God's good design for him. And that God has placed him in a difficult situation for the defense of the gospel. So Paul can say, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Even though we say this is strange because Paul's the greatest missionary who's ever lived. So why would God put this man in a place where he can't go places? That's because God had a design, a plan for the gospel to advance right there where he was in that moment. And God knew what he was doing. So remember this. In order to advance the gospel, we need to see every situation as a gospel advancing situation. There are things that happen to us in life. Amen? There are things that happen to us in life. Things that hurt. Daily. We live in a broken world. And we still experience brokenness in our lives, don't we? There are many in this room right now who are facing very difficult things. In fact, if I sat down with you today and I said, hey, what happened to you? Like Paul says, hey, I want you to know what happened to me, okay? I bet if I sat down with you and I said, hey, what happened to you this week? I bet you could tell me something that happened to you this week that you didn't like, right? You think you could tell me something that happened in your life this week that you did not like, right? I think we could. Why do those things happen to us? I don't know if we can answer that question fully, but this text today leads me to ask God an important question, and it's this, or to say this to God. God, I don't know why this is happening. God, I don't know why this is happening to me, but how can you advance the gospel through this situation? God, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why there's sickness. I don't know why there's difficulty at work. I don't know why parenting is so hard. I don't know why uh, all of these bad things keep on happening. We, we don't know fully why these bad things are happening, but, but what I see in this text today is that God can use difficult situations in our lives to advance the gospel. And so a question we might ask and we should ask is, God, I don't know why, but how can you advance the good news of Jesus through this, through what's happening through what's going on? How can this disease advance the gospel? How can this struggle advance the gospel? How can this job advance the gospel? How can going to school advance the gospel? How can parenting advance the gospel? God, these people you've put in my life, I don't know why, but how can you advance the gospel through this situation? And I realize that we don't often think like that when we're facing struggles, but I think it's how we should think. John Piper, pastor, he pastored the Bethlehem Baptist Church for years. He would often say this to the kids at his church, and I think this one's worth remembering. He said this, when things don't go the way they should, God always makes them turn for good. When things don't go the way they should, God always makes them turn for good. Church family, I realize that often we think that the only way that God can turn something for our good is if he will completely remove all the pain and suffering from our lives. I know that we would think that that, that must be the only way that God could be good to us is if whatever we're facing, God would take it off our plate and remove it from us. But as I read the scriptures, I see that God often does not do that. He often does not remove suffering from believers' lives. In fact, 
Jesus told his disciples, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, for I've overcome the world. And so, the good that sometimes God may have in mind for us is that we would know Jesus more fully, embrace him more fully, have a deeper walk with him, and also that maybe not only that we would know Jesus more, but that we would make him known. That when believers go through difficult times in their lives, like the Apostle Paul was going through a difficult time in his life, and yet the gospel moves on. It keeps going. I heard an interesting quote the other day, and I don't know if it's true, but I think it sounds good, so we'll go with it, all right? Life is 10% what you make it and 90% how you take it. Is that true? (laughs) Okay, I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds good. Life is 10% what you make it, and 90% how you take it. And I think the point is this, that it does seem like there's a lot of things that are out of our control often that happen on a daily basis in our lives, right? Cars breaking down, things at work not going well, people getting the flu, sick, you know, all kinds of things happening. And sometimes it could be like, well, God, what am I supposed to do in this situation? But if it's true that 90% of life is how we take it, then maybe the answer is, God, I don't know why this is happening, but how can I respond to this in a way that advances the gospel? How can you use this mess for a channel to tell somebody about Jesus Christ? So Paul says his suffering, his situation really served to advance the gospel. Well, how? How did he do it? Well, first, I believe Paul saw every situation in life as a gospel-advancing situation. And I think that that's the same thing we need to do. Let's begin approaching every situation, every situation as a gospel-advancing situation. Well, let's say you look at life that way. Let's say you begin looking at all these opportunities as missions moments. What do you say to people? How does the gospel advance? Our second point is this. So how do we become gospel-advancing Christians? We see every situation as a gospel-advancing situation. And number two, the gospel is is advanced through proclaiming Christ. The gospel is advanced through proclaiming Christ. So what do we say to people? Well, notice in our text that after Paul says in verse 12 that what happened to him has really served to advance the gospel, look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Well, how does the imperial guard and all the rest know that Paul is in prison because of Jesus? How do they know that? He told them. He told them, right? Right? He, he, told, he was verbal about his faith. There was no mystery, okay? Here's a man in brokenness, but he's vocal about Jesus. He's telling people about Jesus. And, and so how did they find out? Well, man, you got these Roman soldiers. Actually, the, this group of people that he talks about, the Imperial Guard, these are the Roman emperor's elite bodyguards. I mean, these are important soldiers. And What they would do is they would guard Paul, and there were lots of them, but they would take shifts. And so about every four hours, they would would change. And so new guards would come and guard Paul. Four hours later, new guards would come and guard Paul. Here's Paul in prison, in chains. And yet, all of these soldiers are hearing about Jesus because God just keeps bringing them into his life. You know, here's another guard, here's another guard. And all the rest are hearing about Christ. These are people that Paul, had he not gone through this hardship, he would have not had access to. Is it possible that sometimes the difficult situations that God may place us in in life is to give us access to people that we normally wouldn't have access to? God has a way of advancing the gospel through our difficulties by bringing people into our lives that maybe we normally wouldn't see. And this is the case, I believe, right here in this text, and they're hearing about Jesus. Recently, we took our students through evangelism training where they learned how to turn everyday conversations about problems 
into conversations about Jesus. Because that's one of the most natural ways to talk about Jesus with people because naturally everybody on a daily basis are talking about what's wrong with the world. We're talking about problems, issues. It's everywhere. And when we have these conversations with others, how do we turn a conversation about difficulty into a conversation about Jesus? You know, it might be as simple as saying something like this. I don't understand fully what you're going through in your life right now, but can I share something with you that has really helped me? I don't maybe fully understand the difficulty or the problem that you're going through in your life, but we've all faced some problems, right? Can I share with you something that's helped me? And you know what? You just begin to talk about how Jesus gives you hope, how Jesus gives you peace, how Jesus gives you strength, how Jesus has overcome the grave, how we have hope in this life and in the life to come. And you begin to talk about what Christ has done. Have you ever wondered why our world is so broken? It wasn't that way in the beginning. There was a perfect design. We departed from it. There's brokenness. There's sin. But God has stepped into our brokenness. Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and now we can have hope even when things are difficult in this life. Because we know that God is for us, not against us. And by God's grace, we can begin to recover and pursue his design for our lives. There can be healing in this life. There can be recovery in this life. And if not fully in this life, we look forward to the one to come. It's a powerful thing when Christians face hardships and keep on talking about Jesus. And we might think that this isn't a very good commercial for Christianity. You have Jesus. Look at Paul. Okay, Paul, you're a, you have faith in Jesus Christ. How's that working out for you? Well, I'm in prison. That's not a very good Christian. That's maybe not a good commercial for Christianity. So all these guards are seeing Paul. He's chained and and he's telling them about Jesus, how is that a good advertisement for Christianity? Oh, yeah, follow Christ, and you might end up in jail like me, right? And yet, and yet, the gospel is advancing. God is using this situation, this difficulty, to change people's lives. Why is that? How, how can that happen? Because... When we talk about Jesus and trust in him and we proclaim him, even when we're going through difficult times in our life, it sends a very powerful message to our world. The message is this. Jesus is more valuable to us than living a pain-free life. Jesus is more valuable to us than living a life free of pain. That's why Paul would go on and he would say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's why he would go on and say that whatever gain he used to have, he counts as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In other words, gaining Jesus is everything. And everything else begins to lose, lose its value. So our world values comfort. Our world values money. Our world values greed and power and control. Christians treasure Christ. And when life happens to us, we don't lose hope. That's why even when people are trying to hurt Paul in the way that they were going about ministry, he's like, ah, you know what? As long as Christ is proclaimed in that, I rejoice the anchor of joy in Paul's life was not his circumstances. The anchor of joy in Paul's life was that Jesus was being proclaimed, even through difficult times. We know that Jesus has met our greatest need and that he alone gives peace and strength and hope. And we don't have to fear the unknown because he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. So advance the gospel by telling people that you have access to, because of your situation, about the hope that you have in Jesus and what he has done to heal our souls and to give us the promise of a future with no more pain, no more suffering. Why do we have that hope? Because Jesus rose from the dead, because he defeated sin. We have this message. Proclaiming Jesus through trials opens the eyes of those around us to see that Jesus is real. 
So how does the gospel advance? The gospel advances when, one, we see every situation as a gospel-advancing situation. And number two, the gospel advances through proclaiming Christ. And number three, the gospel is advanced through our example. The gospel is advanced through our example. See, the way that Paul talked about Jesus in the midst of this difficulty in his life made an impact not only on non-believers, but it also had a profound impact on believers. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What a fascinating passage. You would think that believers who are watching Paul suffer would say, I don't think I want to speak any more about Jesus because I don't want that to happen to me. But in fact, the exact opposite happened. Believers saw Paul proclaiming Jesus in prison, using that situation to advance the gospel, and the gospel advanced because believers saw it, and they were like, this is the real deal. If a man can go through that and proclaim Christ, we're going to be more bold. We're not going to stop. Nothing can stop the advancement of the gospel. And it actually made them bold. And if you look through the history of the church, even today, you look at brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted, who are going through difficulty. You know what? The church isn't dying in those areas. The church is exploding in those areas. The gospel is advancing. God uses persecution and difficulty and hardship to advance the gospel. He's been doing that since the beginning. Prison can't stop the advance of the gospel. Cancer can't stop the advancement of the gospel. Sickness can't stop the advancement of the gospel. The brokenness and difficulties we experience on a daily basis cannot stop the advancement of the gospel. Listen, the gospel is powerful, and it changes us, and it changes others. Don't underestimate the influence that your faith has on others. Parents, don't underestimate the impact that your faith has on your children as they watch you walk through trials. When we walk through trials, trusting in Jesus and still speaking his name, it has a profound impact on those who see it. And you know, sometimes it takes the boldness of one to stir up the boldness of us all, doesn't it? I remember years ago watching a student who was facing cancer, and I just watched what God did in his life. This is a teenager. And I watched how bold he became with the gospel and how God was using him to share that message with, with others. I mean, this, this was a, a guy who was going through difficulty, but I watched how God used that difficult time in his life to grow him closer to Jesus and then to use him to minister to others. I've watched some of you in this room go through terrible loss, and you still love Jesus. Don't underestimate the influence that that has on your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in this room. It has an impact. Jim Elliott, that great missionary, and four of his missionary friends were killed by the Alka Indians. You would think that people would say, the mission field is not for me, but you know what? A high number of Wheaton College graduates offered themselves as missionaries in the years following. When people see Christians who hang on to Christ because Christ hung on to them, through their difficulty, and they proclaim the goodness of Jesus and the saving power of the gospel, when you go through difficult times in your life, it's powerful. It shows that this is real, that we're not just playing around. I want to be a gospel-advancing Christian, and I want to be a part of a gospel-advancing church. Maybe it's going to take the courage of one of us in this room, or maybe two or three of us in this room, to stir up the courage of us all. God used Paul, a man, to stir up the courage of other believers. I believe that we're either thermostats or thermometers, okay? Thermometers 
reflect the temperature in a room. Thermostats set the temperature in a room. The Apostle Paul was a thermostat. He set the temperature. And the believers began to reflect that. We need some thermostats in this church. We need some believers who have courage and boldness to say, no matter what, no matter what, we're advancing the gospel. No matter what hardship it brings, we're talking about Jesus here. We're letting people know that he's our hope. He's our strength. His boldness, Paul's boldness, made others bold. Now, Francis Chan, many of you know him. A lot of our community groups are actually going through his book, Crazy Love, which is a fantastic book. But he tells a story that I'd like to share with you. He tells a story about one of the pastors on his staff who witnessed a bad incident of road rage. And as he was driving, the car in front of him accidentally hit a guy on a bicycle and knocked him down. The cyclist got up, and he started pounding on the hood of the driver's car. He opened the driver's side door, and he began kicking and punching the driver. The driver was a 75-year-old man. The pastor was faced with a decision. Do I stay in my car with my baby in the back seat, or do I get out of my car and try to stop this man from beating this man up? Well, he decided to get out of the car, and he was going to go over and try to stop that man. The cyclist wouldn't stop, and he got physical even with the pastor, ripping his shirt off, trying to get back to the, the guy so he could beat him up. So the pastor made a decision in that moment. He decided that he was going to punch this guy, okay? In fact, with one uppercut punch, he knocked him out, okay? Okay? What was that? <laughs> and hey, all of the witnesses who saw this happen, they were honking their horns. They were, they were clapping. They were, they were excited because a man stood up for this guy, okay? And probably it was a one-punch thing. So Francis asks his church, he says, how many of you would have gotten out of the car and tried to stop this assault even if the guy was bigger than you? And most of the congregation nodded their head. Yeah, we would do that. We would do that. Most would get out and do something. They had the courage to intervene. And then he said this. And this is what Francis does. He, like, punches you in the gut, okay? And then he says this. How many of you would go speak the gospel to a 75-year-old man who is sitting alone at a restaurant if you knew that he was not a Christian? Would you even engage in a spiritual conversation with him? Why is it that we find it easy to be courageous in physical matters, but difficult in this spiritual matter? He said, why are we cowards when it comes to speaking the gospel? And you know, that's a good question. It's a good question to ponder that there's often times when we're brave and there's often times when we're scared. But we need to be reminded today that the gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful and that it's worth being shared. And church family, we need courage. We need boldness. Let's look to the example of Paul and others who put the gospel ahead of personal comfort and ease. And maybe somebody here today will say, I'll be the thermostat. I'll go through it. I want you to know there are many here today who are going through difficult things and your faith in Jesus is powerful. It's powerful. But may God advance the gospel through us as we see every situation as a situation to advance the gospel, that we would proclaim Jesus in those situations, and then set an example for others to follow in the way that we live out our faith with courage. Hey, today, if you need to call out to Jesus to save you, today's the day. We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. If today you've never received Christ into your life, you've never believed that, that on him that he died in your place on the cross, and that's the only thing that can make you right with God, if you've never called out to Jesus to save you, why don't you do that today? Call out to Jesus. We'll be happy to pray with you. Believer, if you're a Christian today, let's be reminded that the gospel is awesome and powerful and wonderful 
And let's begin to ask God to help us see life in a different way, a new perspective. Whatever is going to happen tomorrow in your life, I don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow, okay? But maybe you could ask God and say, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but whatever happens, let me see how I can advance the gospel through this and then be ready to talk about Jesus and ask God for courage to do that. Let's pray together.